Right. Um, thank you again for coming back out for another Therapy Ed Office Hour. Tonight we have Dr. Derek Daniels here to present to us on stuttering and fluency, dis uh, fluency disorders. Excuse me. Dr. Derek E. Daniels is an Associate Professor and Graduate Program Director for the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders, Speech Language Pathology and Audiology at Wayne State University. He is a licensed and certified speech language pathologist who stutter, uh, specializes in stuttering therapy and has presented locally, nationally, and internationally on stuttering. Dr. Daniels is a person who stutters, conducts research on psychosocial aspects of stuttering, and supervises graduate student training in stuttering through Wayne State University's Speech and Language Clinic. He also serves as the Research and Parent Program Director for Camp Shoutout, a recreational slash therapeutic camp for children and teens who stutter. Dr. Daniels has participated in many self-help events, workshops, and clinical training programs for people who stutter. He is a native of Houston, Texas, and currently enjoys urban life in Detroit. Dr. Daniels is a former president of the Michigan State, uh, excuse me, the Michigan Speech and Language Hearing Association, and currently serves as the association's vice president for diversity, equity, and inclusion. In 2023, he received the Professional of the Year Award from the National Stuttering Association. With that, I just want to say thank you for being here, Dr. Daniels, and I'll turn everything over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get started. Um, I do all things stuttering, so I'm very happy to talk to you about stuttering and um, give you a refresher on uh, important aspects of stuttering clinical practice. So as soon as I can get my PowerPoint. Okay, here we go. So we're gonna um, go through this and then I have a few questions, a few practice questions at the end. So this is reviewing the chapter on stuttering and other fluency disorders. So these are when we talk about fluency and different types of fluency disorders, it's important to understand that there are different areas that fall under what we call fluency disorders. I have this um, word conditions here in red because in the stuttering community, we are sort of having lots of discussions around stuttering and we're having lots of discussions about what, con what constitutes a disorder. So I'm going to say this in um, the next slide, but there are a lot of people who stutter who don't consider themselves to have a disorder, and there are some people who stutter who do. So we don't want to automatically assume that just because someone stutters, they have a disorder. So that's why I have that word conditions here um, in red. So we're going to talk about fluency and disfluency. We're going to spend the most of our time talking about childhood onset stuttering, um, sometimes we can refer to that as um, developmental stuttering, and sometimes you might hear the term persistent developmental stuttering. So those are all synonymous terms. We're going to spend just a little bit of time on acquired stuttering and then just a little bit of time on cluttering. So cluttering, acquired stuttering, and childhood onset stuttering, all three of those fall under the category of fluency disorders. So again, we're gonna spend the most time on childhood onset stuttering. And in particular, we'll talk about etiology, the nature and characteristics of it, just a couple of theoretical foundations, principles of assessment, and then some intervention approaches. So our thinking about stuttering is changing. So the way that we talked about stuttering 30 years ago, 20 years ago, even 15 years ago is now changing. So in, historically, when we have talked about stuttering in the past, we were talking about stuttering from an impairment-based perspective. So we focused a lot on disfluencies and we focused a lot on the frequency of how much a person stuttered. And historically, treatments were all about what can we do to minimize or reduce the person's frequency of stuttering as much as possible. But that's all changing now. We're now looking at stuttering um, in the context of neurodiversity, which is the idea that stuttering is simply a variation in how a person talks. And it's not the result of an abnormal brain. It's just a result of neurological differences. And so for many people, stuttering can be a celebration of speech diversity. So there are 
many people who can experience stuttering as a disorder, meaning that it's very debilitating to them um, and it diminishes their quality of life. And these are the people who come to us for therapy. There also though are a lot of people who stutter where um, stuttering is seen as an identity, it's seen as a characteristic and it's a celebration of speech diversity. So how a person perceives and how they view their stuttering is completely individualized. Some people prefer person who stutters, some people prefer stutterer, some people prefer neither of those things. So we have to really be mindful of the variation that exists um, in the experience of stuttering. And we also have to be mindful of the variation that exists in terms of the meaning that people attach to themselves um, and their stuttering. Okay, so when we talk about fluency, we're talking about the forward, smooth, effortless flow of speech. That's probably a definition you learned in your graduate uh, courses. So fluency is typically smooth for the most part. It's typically effortless. So we don't really have to think a whole lot about talking. We get an idea and then we say that idea and there's not a whole lot of effort that's involved with fluency. We can talk about it in terms of rate, which refers to the speed at which a person speaks. We can talk about fluency in terms of continuity. So again, typically fluency is pretty smooth for the most part. And then we can also talk about it in the context of effort, which means that it doesn't require a lot of work um, when talking. But all of those things can be impacted for people who stutter. When we talk about a disfluency then, it's any interruption in that forward flow of speech. So everybody, both people who stutter and people who don't stutter experience disfluency. So there are disfluencies that we may categorize as typical. And what that means is that these disfluencies are the result primarily of language formulation. You're trying to put the message together. And these are examples of what we would call typical disfluencies that everyone experiences. So example, I want, I want to drink. I need, um, can you please hand me that book? We um, went to the store yesterday. So in each of those examples, I was experiencing disfluency, but the disfluency was more related to language formulation. That's different than a speaker who knows exactly what they want to say. So it's not an issue of language formulation, but it's in, but the speaker is feeling the sensation of being stuck and unable to move forward. And that's what we mean when we say stuttering. When people who stutter are stuttering, they typically describe it as a feeling of being stuck. So I'm gonna say each of those three disfluencies again, and I want you to listen for the difference. I want, I want to drink versus I want, I want, I want, I want, I want to drink. And the second one, that would be an example of what we would call stuttering. Because even though it was a phrase repetition and it's under the category of a typical disfluency, I wasn't using it in a typical way. We um, went to the store versus we um, 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 went to the store. In the first case, that was a typical disfluency. In the second case, there was an, that was an instance of stuttering. So many times a person who stutters might have typical disfluencies, those categories, but they may use them in atypical ways because they anticipate being stuck on the next sound. So when we talk about phrase repetitions and phrase revisions and interjections, those are typical disfluencies that everyone has, but depending on how it catches your ear, a person who stutters, they might use these in atypical ways. So when we talk about stuttering, stuttering is neurodevelopmental, or sometimes you may hear the phrase neurophysiological. So it arises during childhood. And for some people, they um, 
may outgrow stuttering and they never stutter anymore. And for um, some people, the stuttering persists. But we can say now with certainty that most stuttering has a genetic predisposition. So people who stutter have genes that predispose them to having disfluent speech. We haven't quite mapped out what exactly those genes are yet, and we haven't quite mapped out how those genes work and interact together, but we can say that there's a genetic predisposition. So we have genes, and then we have this term here, epigenetics refers to um, the timing and intensity of gene expression. So you may have genes that predispose you for a certain condition, but those genes may or may not be expressed. And that's what epigenetics refers to, whether or not those genes are expressed or whether they're not expressed. And then we have experience. So people have certain experiences around their condition that can make it harder for them to function. So stuttering is not caused by experience. Stuttering is caused by that genetic predisposition that predisposes a person to having disfluencies in their speech. So when people who stutter, again, I talked about that genetic predisposition, if those genes are expressed, they're expressed in the brain in different ways. So the areas of the brain that are responsible for speech motor control, so we can talk about the basal ganglia, we can talk about the cerebellum, um, we can talk about the supplementary motor area, all of those regions in the left hemisphere of the brain that are responsible for speech motor control, those are the regions that are affected in people who stutter. So the white matter in the brain that, um, the, the white matter of the brain in the speech motor control areas of the brain, the white matter tends to be less dense in people who stutter. So again, it makes them more vulnerable to having disfluency in their speech. So this is sort of a model here for talking about cause. We have genes that affect how the brain activates speech, and then that results in disfluencies that the person has. So when we talk about stuttering, we talked about the fact that everyone has disfluencies, everyone has typical disfluencies, and then for people who stutter in particular, they have what are called core behaviors. These are disfluencies that are specific to people who stutter because of that feeling of being stuck. So you may have learned about core behaviors, primary behaviors, or stutter-like disfluencies. These are all synonymous terms. So these are sound or a syllable repetition. So P -p 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 pizza or g -g 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 green or b -b 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 ball. Stuttering typically happens at the level of the syllable. A person might have single syllable whole word, word repetition. So my, my, my teddy bear or she, 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 she went to the store. A prolongation is where a sound is stretched typically for more than a second. So like this, and then blocks or moments where there's temporarily no sound like this. So it's important that you recognize and understand what the core behaviors of stuttering are. And these are what we call the core behaviors. Then we have coping strategies, sometimes called secondary behaviors. You may even sometimes hear the term accessory behaviors. These are all of the things that are associated with the stuttering, but it's not the physical stutter itself. So as people who stutter live with their stuttering, many times they try and do things to try and not stutter. And those are what we call coping strategies. So examples of these might be tension. You might see tension in the face, tension in the jaw, tension in the lips. 
Sometimes a person might have a rising intonation at the end of their sentences or at the end of their clauses because they're stretching or tensing their vocal folds. You might see struggle behaviors where speech looks very effortful. Sometimes a person might um, nod their head or they might move their hands or they might move their arms. Circumlocutions, talking around a word. So if a person anticipates that they may stutter, that, they, that, that they'll stutter on the word pencil, they may say writing utensil instead of pencil. Uh, tongue clicking, whoops. And this is not an exhaustive list, but again, these are all of the things that some people who stutter do in an effort to try and not stutter. And these are different categories of secondary behaviors. So escape behaviors are behaviors that a person might do because they're in a moment of stuttering and they're trying to escape the moment. So if I'm in a block like this and I'm moving my hand trying to escape that block, this hand movement will be an escape behavior. An avoidance behavior is anything that a person does because they anticipate that they might stutter, so they do something in an attempt to not stutter to begin with. So a person might anticipate stuttering on the word, again, pencil. So before they say pencil, they may say writing utensil. So that's an avoidance behavior. And then we have feelings and attitudes. So we have core behaviors is one important component of stuttering. We have secondary behaviors or coping strategies. And then we have feelings and attitudes. These are um, different emotions, beliefs, and forms of self-talk that are formed within the speaker. So some people who stutter might feel embarrassed. They might feel ashamed. They might have anxiety around their stuttering and they may talk to themselves negatively. And there may be some people who feel very positive about their stuttering and they may feel pride and they say what they wanna say and it doesn't affect them at all. So depending on the person and depending on the environment in which they were raised, they may have positive or they may have negative feelings and attitudes around their stuttering. But anytime if these attitudes and feelings and self-talk, if they're negative or if they're self-defeating, these are things that are very important to address in therapy. So the ABCs of stuttering is a framework that's sort of used to um, put together all of those important pieces. So the A is affective. So affective refers to emotions. How does the person feel about themselves and about their speech? It could be happy, it could be sad, it could be mad, it could be angry, it could be guilty. The behavioral components, the B, these refer to the specific disfluencies and the specific speech patterns that the person has. And then the C here, when we talk about the cognitive components in stuttering, it's different than what you might talk about if you're talking about aphasia. So for stuttering, when we talk about the cognitive components, we're talking about the thoughts that the person has developed around their stuttering. So a person may say, I'm never gonna get that job, or the person may say, I'm a terrible communicator. How they talk to themselves, that self-talk is what we mean by the C. So the ABCs of stuttering, it's simply a multi-dimensional way of looking at the experience of stuttering. You may have also learned about or seen the iceberg illustration. It's a very classic illustration in stuttering. The idea here is that we can think about stuttering like an iceberg. So at the tip of the iceberg, these are all of the things that, that are visible about a person stuttering. So we may be able to see the person stuttering. We may be able to see tension that the person has. So all of the overt features of stuttering represent the tip of the iceberg. And then everything beneath the waterline are all of the covert parts of stuttering. So the idea here is that a large part of the experience of stuttering are things that we can't see. So these would be things like anticipation about 
these may be things like anxiety. These may be things like how the person feels, how they talk to themselves. So this is sort of a classic illustration here in, in the Duttering Sheehan's iceberg. This is another uh, conceptualization of the iceberg. So the iceberg doesn't have to be all negative. So on the left side here, you see one example of an iceberg. And then on the right side, this is another sort of conceptualization of an iceberg that's um, more positive. And depending on who the person is talking to, depending on what the situation is, a person's iceberg, metaphorically speaking, might look different. And then this is an example here of a stigma iceberg. So those first two icebergs I showed you, they all relate to the person. This iceberg here relates to the stigmas in society around stuttering. So there's a largely there's largely a negative stigma towards stuttering in society. Some stigmas are visible and then some stigmas are less visible. So in addition to looking at features of the person, it's also important to have an understanding of how a person who stutters might be socially penalized. Okay, so some general facts here about stuttering. Prevalence refers to how many people walking around today are people who stutter. So about 1% of the population, about three, about 3 million people in the US are people who stutter. Incidence refers to how many people have stuttered at some point in their lives. And that's about 5% of the population. So remember, there may be people who stuttered when they were younger as children, and then maybe they outgrew stuttering as they got older. Stuttering typically emerges between the ages of two and six. So this is a time when language is rapidly developing. It is possible for some people to have uh, a late onset of stuttering. I've known of cases where people said they started stuttering when they were eight or nine years old. I mean, it is possible for a person to have a late onset, but typically with stuttering, we're gonna see it emerge between the ages of two and six. And then we know that stuttering is more frequent in males than females. So in young children, the ratio is about two to one. And then in older children and adults, the ratio is about four to one. So for every four males who stutter, we have a female. And stuttering often runs in families. People who stutter do not differ in levels of intelligence from people who don't. As many as 80% of preschool children who stutter will outgrow it, outgrow it without treatment, which is very interesting. So again, if we look at the preschool population, if we look at those children who have true stuttering, those preschool kids, about 80% of those cases will outgrow stuttering um, without treatment. And then about 20% of those children will persist and it will become chronic. Stuttering can co-occur with other communication disorders. A lot of children who stutter may have co-occurring phonological disorders or co-occurring language disorders. And again, we talked about earlier, um, research has shown that people who stutter have different um, activity patterns in the brain during moments of stuttering. So we see differences in white matter density in the speech motor regions of the left hemisphere of the brain. So in particular, looking at the cerebellum, looking at the uh, basal ganglia, the putamen is part of the basal ganglia. So these are regions of the brain that are responsible for speech motor control and the white matter density, the white matter in those regions tends to be less dense in people who stutter. These are just trends that we see across cases of stuttering when we look at um, findings from neuroimaging. Okay, um, these are some trends here. Stuttering is really interesting for a lot of reasons. Um, these aren't facts, but these are just some trends that typically shows up, uh, show up in people who stutter. The adaptation effect is the idea that if a person reads the same passage 
over and over and over again consecutively that their fluency tends to increase. So the second time they read it, they're gonna be more fluent than the first time. The third time they read the passage, they're gonna be more fluent than the second time than the first time. So that's the adaptation effect. The consistency effect is the idea that if a person reads the same passage over and over again, their fluency is likely to increase. That's the adaptation effect. But the words that they stutter on are likely gonna be the same words that they stuttered on in the earlier passages. So there, there tends to be um, consistency in um, the words or the sounds that a person might stutter on. And then expectancy is the idea that people, many people can predict or anticipate what sounds and what words um, they're gonna be more disfluent on. And this varies from person to person. It's very individualized. So Spencer Brown um, did this research back in the 1940s, but it still kind of rings true today, is that stuttering typically happens at the beginning. So again, typically at the beginning of a word or at the beginning of a clause boundary is where you're likely to find the most stuttering. Tends to occur on longer and more grammatically complex utterances. Stuttering typically happens more on stressed syllables than unstressed. But these last two here are pretty important. Stuttering severity can change depending on the social situation, depending on the person, depending on who the person is talking to, and depending on what the communicative intent is. So a person might have a lot of stuttering when they're talking to authority figures, but they may have very little stuttering when they're talking to a best friend. They may have a lot more stuttering when they're giving an oral presentation than they might have if they're talking one-on-one. -on -one. So stuttering is highly variable. And this is the reason why it's so confusing to the public. So people in the general public typically think that stuttering is a result of being nervous, that it's a result of being anxious, or that it's an, an emotional or a psychological problem, um, which it is not. But the reason why people misunderstand stuttering so is because in it's in large part because of the variability of stuttering. So here, stuttering variability. So I mentioned how stuttering is interesting. Stuttering typically diminishes or almost disappears under certain conditions, and it typically increases under other conditions. So people who stutter typically do not stutter when they sing. And this is simply because singing and talking are two very different neurological activities. Talking is very much a left hemisphere function. Singing is very much a right hemisphere function. Singing, singing is very neurophysiologic. Singing is neurophysiologically different than talking. People who stutter tend not to stutter if they're speaking or if they're reading in unison. Um, talking in the presence of noise or talking um, in the presence of a beat. Talking under um, different forms of feedback. So um, delayed auditory feedback and frequency altered feedback. This is where a person either might have a little device that looks like a hearing aid, or sometimes it could be headphones. And when they hear themselves talk, their voice is played back to them at a delay. Or sometimes it's played back to them at a different frequency. And for many people, this um, reduces the frequency of their stuttering. Um, talking to pets or the babies. And we talked about the adaptation effect. So these are common situations where stuttering typically um, d d diminishes or disappears. And then stuttering typically increases under different types of pressures and, and linguistic demands. So a lot of people who stutter will say that the telephone is very difficult for them. Um, talking to authority figures is difficult. And anytime they're in a time pressured situation, 
they tend to stutter more or they tend to feel, um, or they tend to have the feeling that they're going to stutter. So it's very important to understand the variability of stuttering. For every person who stutters, this variability is going to look very different. So in an evaluation, we really want to understand what that variability looks like for the person. Okay, so we're gonna put a pause on stuttering for a second and then we're gonna talk about cluttering. Um, cluttering is also um, what we consider a type of fluency um, condition. People who clutter speak at a rate that's too fast for their system to handle. So it's not just talking fast, it's talking faster than their system is able to handle. So when a person who clutters, when they talk, again, faster than their system is able to handle, um, there's a breakdown in clarity. There's a breakdown in speech clarity, and there's also a, a breakdown in intelligibility. So people who clutter don't clutter all of the time. Um, sometimes um, cluttering happens in bursts, and it really compromises speech clarity. So a person who clutters, they may have excessive normal disfluencies. They may sometimes um, blend or delete syllables, and they may have um, atypical pauses. Um, the thing about cluttering also is that the disfluencies in cluttering look very different than the disfluencies in stuttering. So when we talk about stuttering, we're talking about those core behaviors, those blocks, those prolongations, those sound and syllable repetitions. Many times it's associated with tension, but in cluttering, a person may have excessive disfluencies, but they're not the core behaviors that people who stutter have. And people who clutter, um, their disfluencies don't tend to be accompanied by tension and struggle um, like you'll see in stuttering. People who clutter also typically don't have the um, avoidance and the secondary behaviors that people who stutter have. So with cluttering, um, it's very important to make sure that we are ruling out stutter-like disfluencies. So again, people who clutter don't have the stutter-like disfluencies. Um, their disfluencies are not the result of a language disorder. It's typically just the result of that rapid, irregular rate of speech. And when people who clutter, when they add pauses to their speech, their speech clarity typically improves drastically. And then we also have acquired stuttering, which is a which is another type of fluency condition. So this is stuttering that is the a result of a sudden neurological event. So the result of a stroke, um, head trauma, a brain injury, a tumor, or a neurodegenerative disease, typically the onset is after uh, childhood. But if a child experiences any of those things, they could also have neurogenic or acquired stuttering. So with, with acquired stuttering, um, stuttering, tends to occur equally on function words and content words. And people who experience developmental or childhood onset stuttering, we typically see stuttering a lot more on the content words than the function words. In acquired stuttering, it's not restricted to the initial syllable of words. It's not restricted that way in childhood onset stuttering, but in childhood onset stuttering, we typically see the most stuttering at the beginning. With acquired stuttering, we typically see stuttering equally across the word or the phrase. People who have acquired stuttering have very few secondary behaviors because they haven't lived a lifetime of stuttering for those kinds of behaviors to develop. Stuttering typically does not improve, or I shouldn't say improve, that was the wrong word. The frequency of stuttering doesn't diminish typically with the adaptation effect in people with acquired 
the data ring. And um, there, tends to, there tends to be little to no reduction of stuttering under those fluency inducing conditions that we talked about. And people with acquired stuttering may have little fear and anxiety. So I wanna go back to what I just said here. The reason why I said that um, I said the wrong word when I said improve, that was the wrong choice of words because stuttering um, is not a bad thing. And the goal of therapy is not to get the person to not stutter. People who stutter can be very effective communicators and stutter. So when we talk about improvement, we're not talking about reduction of stuttering. We're talking about an increase in a person's confidence and an increase in their um, ability to communicate. Okay, so when we talk about theoretical foundations of stuttering, I'm not gonna go through all of the theories because I don't think you need to know all of the theories. I'm only gonna talk about a couple of theories that I think have implications for clinical practice. So in the way long, long time ago, people thought that stuttering was a result of a physical or a structural defect. So they thought that it was a result of a person having a misplaced hyoid bone or a large tongue. People thought that stuttering was an underlying weakness in the psyche. These are very, very ancient theories. Probably one of the more well-known theories is uh, cerebral dominance. This was the first, I would say, organized theory of stuttering. People thought that stuttering was a result of confusing the hemispheres of the brain. So the idea here was that if you take a person and you switch their handedness, so you switch them from um, being left-handed to right-handed, the theory was that you confuse the hemispheres of the brain and that results in stuttering. But we know that that is not true. Stuttering is not caused by switching handedness. It is a neurological condition, but it's not a neurological condition for the reasons that they were talking about here. The diagnosogenic theory was a theory introduced by Wendell Johnson. This, this theory here was that people that stuttering was a learned behavior. So the idea here was if you label a person a stutterer and you treat them like people who stutter, whatever that means, that child will then internalize that treatment and then they will begin to stutter as a result of being labeled a stutterer by a parent or by someone from the outside. This is not true. We know that stuttering is not a learned behavior. It's not caused by having someone label a person as a person who stutters. But this is important because the implication here was to not talk about it, to not draw attention to it, and just ignore it. And if you do, it'll go away. That's what we did for a long, long time. And we now know that that's not true. And even with preschool children, we know that talking to preschool children about stuttering won't cause an increase in stuttering. But that fear around using the word stuttering around a young child was the result of this um, outdated diagnosogenic theory. Okay, so we now uh, know that stuttering has genetic components. If you look at identical twins, if one identical twin stutters, there's uh, about a 70% chance that the other identical twin will also stutter. When we look at adoption studies, when we look at children who are adopted by parents who stutter, those adopted children are no more likely to stutter than children in the mainstream population. So we have evidence that stuttering is not a learned behavior and stuttering tends to run in families. So stuttering is multifactorial. It's the result of many factors that come together. So uh, demands and capacities, this was um, not really a theory of what causes stuttering. It's more of a framework for um, how stuttering is maintained. 
So demands and capacities was the original terminology. Now it's called our restart. But this is the idea that children have certain capacities for fluency. And if you place demands on the person that exceed what their capacities are, then you um, might maintain or you might trigger more stuttering for the child. So here, the child may have certain speech related capacities. And if you place demands on the child that exceed what their capacities are, then you might trigger um, stuttering for the child. But if you reduce those demands, then you might, um, the child might have more fluency. So these are things like um, not being overly corrective of the child's speech, not asking um, lots of different open-ended questions in a row. It's um, making sure that the child is not interrupted, giving them space to talk. It's looking in the environment to see what are all of those things that might be making it harder for that child to communicate, and then how can we reduce those demands to make the environment more stable for communication for the child? That's demands and capacities. So I'm not gonna go over this again, but I just want to reorient us to our current thinking about stuttering that um, genes affect how the brain is structured for speech and language. And then that then has an impact on the, the person's speech behavior. Okay, so assessment. When we are looking I think this slide here is probably a very important slide. So I would put five stars around this slide. When we're looking at young children who stutter, um, particularly preschool kids who stutter, we look at what we call predictive factors. Predictive factors mean what factors make it more likely that a preschool child will persist into stuttering. These first five here that are in red, um, in the research, it has shown that these five factors are the most predictive. So if a child has a family history of stuttering because of that genetic component, that um, factor alone will make it more likely that that child might persist into stuttering. So having a family history alone is a reason, is a very important reason to enroll um, a preschool child into therapy. Uh, biological sex, so males tend to persist more than females. Time of onset, so usually those kids who begin to stutter before three and a half are more likely to possibly outgrow stuttering than those kids who start stuttering after the age of three and a half longer time since onset, the longer a person stutters, the less likely it is that they will outgrow stuttering. And then those stutter-like disfluencies that we may observe. So these first five factors here tend to be the most predictive. These other factors that I'm bringing up are also predictive, but they tend to be less predictive than the first five here. So kids who have very sensitive temperaments, um, having coexisting speech and language disorders, showing signs of tension and struggle while talking, if the frequency of the stuttering behaviors progressively increases, if we see secondary behaviors, if the child is aware and concerned. So all of these are predictive. Some of these are more predictive than others. Again, a very important slide. This is very important research. And these are all things that we look for in an evaluation of young preschool children. So in an assessment of young preschool children, we do a thorough case history. We probe for those predictive factors, either off of a case history or we ask the questions. We get parent input. We collect speech samples across different contexts to account for the variability of stuttering. Um, we give standardized 
measures. So there's the test of childhood stuttering that for children between the ages of four and 12. There's also the stuttering severity instrument for children of all ages. So both of these are measures of behavioral severity. And for young preschool children, I think it's important to also give a measure of language and a measure of phonology. And then we can also do non-standardized measures where we're getting different narrative samples across different contexts. So we're getting measures of speech, we're getting measures of language and phonology, and then we also have these non-standardized measures as well. For young preschool children, we can also probe for signs of adverse impact, meaning that for this young preschool child, does it bother them that they stutter? So this is what an evaluation might look like for a young preschool child. If we're looking at a school age child or a teen, we also do a thorough case history. We may get inputs from the parents and the teachers. For the school age child and for the teen, one of our most important questions is, how is stuttering an adverse impact for that child? Our most important question for the preschool kids is, do we think this child is going to persist or do we think this child might outgrow stuttering? And that's based upon how many of those predictive factors do we see. But for the school age children and the teens, our most important question is, is this an adverse impact for the child? Just because a school age child or a teen stutters, it doesn't necessarily mean that they need therapy. In this population, we qualify kids for therapy if the stuttering bothers them to the extent that they can't say or do what they want to do. So we collect uh, speaking samples. We also can get measures of behavioral severity for the school age children and teens. Um, but we also give measures of impact. I love giving the OASIS. It's a nice comprehensive measure um, that looks at um, impact in a variety of domains. The communication attitudes test is good. The behavior assessment battery is good. All of these are really nice measures of impact. And then we can also give non-standardized measures as well. And then for adults in an evaluation, it's pretty similar to evaluation of school-age kids and teens. Um, we do a case history, just like with the school-age kids and teens, we also wanna know how we're stuttering and adverse impact. How is it a problem for the person? We collect speaking samples across different contexts. Um, I think for adults, um, one of the most important things that you can do is give these measures of impact in an evaluation. The OASIS is great. The WASP is great. The modified Erickson scale, their perceptions of stuttering inventory. These are all very nice measures of impact uh, in adults. Okay. So we have our evaluation, and then these are very important diagnostic questions. So if it's a young preschool child, is this childhood onset stuttering? Is it another type of fluency condition? We know that based upon the types of disfluencies and patterns that we see and observe. Uh, what's the history? What choices is the person making because they stutter? Um, how do they feel and think about their communication? What are their present coping strategies? Um, and does it negatively impact their quality of life? So we have to remember that stuttering is multidimensional. It's multi-layered. We have to remember that stuttering has both overt and covert features, which is why we give those measures of impact because there are things about a person's experience that we might not be able to observe. Um, what are the person's ABCs? How do, how do others react to their stuttering? What does their stigma iceberg look like? What's the overall impact? Um, again, for preschool kids, the most important question, are they likely to continue stuttering? For older children and adults, the most important question, how is stuttering affecting them at the present time?
Okay. For preschool children, we never take an ignore approach. We never take an ignore approach with preschool children. So watchful waiting simply means that I'm not ready to do direct therapy, but I'm going to watch and monitor and observe. So for kids who have maybe their behavioral severity is very mild, there's not a whole lot of concern on the parents' parts. Maybe they just started to stutter. Um, they're younger than three and a half, and they don't have any predictive factors, especially no family history. For those kids, you know, we may take a watchful waiting approach, especially if the child has really good phonological skills. It's been shown in the research that those kids, those preschool kids with weaker phonological skills tended to persist into stuttering than those preschool kids with strong phonological skills. We might consider therapy if a child is older than three and a half, they've been stuttering, um, you know, the onset has been longer than let's say three months. They're concerned, the parents are concerned, they have a lot of predictive factors, especially if they have a family history we might consider enrolling um, in therapy and working with the child and the family. Um, for kids who don't have a documented family history of stuttering, it's important to really look at their phonological skills because that could be the distinguishing factor between whether or not you think the child needs therapy or not. Again, children with weaker phonological skills, those kids in the research tended to persist into stuttering. So it's important to get a measure of their phonology for that reason. Okay, so I have eight more minutes. Okay, for intervention, for preschool children, the young kids, therapy can be direct or it can be indirect. Indirect therapy means we're working more in the environment. Direct therapy means we're working directly with the child um, on their speech. So with indirect or less direct therapy, these are things like parent counseling, parent training, modifying the home environment. We're educating the parents and the families about stuttering. We're educating them about what the behaviors are. We're educating them about how certain demands might make it harder for the child to communicate. So Parent training and parent counseling, I think should be done really with all parents, regardless of if the therapy is direct or indirect. But for some preschool kids, we might be able to do some less direct, indirect therapy. And for some kids, that may be all that they need. For other kids, they may need more direct forms of therapy. So we're looking for things like fast rates of speech. Um, if people are not pausing, if the child is being frequently interrupted by other people, they're not giving time to talk. If people are asking them frequent open-ended questions and not giving them time to respond. If people are frequently criticizing and correcting their speech and drawing negative attention to it. If there's inconsistent listening, um, these are all things that we wanna watch for so that we can ed educate the family and educate the environment on how to make the environment a lot more conducive to the child and their communication. For direct therapy, this is where we are working directly with the child um, on their speech. And so um, we might work on reduced rate. We might help the child pause more. We might work on easy talking. So easy talking just simply means um, it's talking where the child is having uh, less tension in their talking. It doesn't mean that the child is not stuttering. It just means that their talking is easier and um, there's, there, there's just less tension um, when they're talking. We might talk about easy starts. And then we create an overall communication environment that supports the child's capacities. So easy, relaxed speech, we may rephrase what the child has said. They say something, we rephrase it in an easier way. We might um, help the family and the environment to, um, um, with a turn taking to make sure that the, that, the, that the child is not interrupted a lot. We do things to resist time pressure. Time pressure makes it harder 
for the child to communicate. So any circumstance where we observe time pressure, we wanna be sure that we reduce that time pressure. And then we listen, we attend, we're patient, and we don't um, provide negative feedback for the child's stuttering. These are examples of different uh, therapy programs for young preschool kids who stutter. Um, therapy is always individualized to the needs of the child, but these um, are different programs that you can look, look up that are specific to preschool kids. Okay, for um, school age kids and adults, all of these steps are the same. So I can do pre I can do school age kids and adults at the same time. So we always educate people about communication, about speech and stuttering. We just don't jump into therapy and try to reduce their stuttering. That's not what we do. We help them to understand that therapy is all about communication. Sometimes you will communicate and stutter. Sometimes you might communicate and not stutter. It's all communication. So we talk about communication, we talk about speech, we talk about stuttering. We help them to identify their communication strengths. Every person has communicative strengths. We might talk about core behaviors and secondary behaviors and feelings and attitudes, and we help them to identify what it looks like for them personally. And we may also talk about stigma and how stigma um, exists and how it's important to advocate for yourself and how it's important to advocate for your needs if you are being stigmatized by other people. Desensitization is helping the person to feel comfortable in different speaking situations. So we might make a hierarchy of situations where we help them to identify what situations give them the least amount of trouble and which ones give them the most amount of trouble. And we may actually practice open stuttering in situations that are easy and then work our way up to situations that are hard. I want the person to understand that stuttering can be okay and that we don't want them to run away from or avoid stuttering. We want them to be able to stutter and stutter with confidence. Modification is where a person might choose to make changes to their speech. Not everyone chooses to make changes to their speech. Some people will and some people won't. So this is, this is about making changes to speech behaviors if desired. And then everything that we do in therapy, we want it to stabilize and we want it to generalize from one context to the other. So if we're working on confidence and if we're working, if we're working on open stuttering, and stuttering confidently, we want that to be able to generalize from one context to the other. Whatever the goals are that we're working on in therapy, we want to systematically um, make sure that those goals are generalizing from one setting to the other. And then I also included here examples of fluency shaping and stuttering modification. These are the specific strategies that a person might do if they choose to make a change to their speech. Fluency shaping is about easier initiation and easier flow of speech. So these are things like easy onsets, light contacts, and reduced rate of talking. And then stuttering modification is about tension reduction. So it's helping the person to identify where they feel stuck or where they feel tight. And it's helping them to modify their tension so that their communication can flow easier. So these are cancellations, pullouts, preparatory sets, and easier stuttering. So um, I'm happy to go back and explain some of these things in more detail if you need me to. I know it's already eight o'clock, so I at least wanted to give you a couple of practice questions before we go. So in this sample question here, would you say it's A, B, C, or D? You can either unmute or you can type it in the chat. And for some reason, I can't see the chat. 
Okay, now I can see it. Yes, yes, exactly. Yep, you got it. All, all of the above. Okay. Okay, here's question two. Mm -hmm. I see A. Yes. So she's four years old. It's already been two years. Um, and the types of disfluencies that she has are those core behaviors of stuttering. Uh huh. Correct. Okay. What about this one? Yes, all of the above. Mm -hmm. And then this is the last one right here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Correct, correct. So um, here are some helpful resources here. You have the book, I know, there's my contact. I know I was talking really fast. I was trying to get it all in in an hour, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, or if there's something you want me to expand upon, I'm happy to, to do that as well. Right. Well, if no one has any questions, um, we'll just say thank you so much, Dr. Daniels, for coming out and giving us that amazing lecture. Um, next week, we'll be back at the same time for a discussion on ethics. So we hope everybody comes on out for that. And then, um, as always, this lecture was recorded and will be available on Therapy Ed's YouTube channel within the next few days, along with all of the past recordings. So take a look at that for another resource. And with that, we'll say thank you and good night. Thank you.